We're all here because on the 18th of September, in case you hadn't realised, you will be asked a question. The question will be, should Scotland be an independent country? And you'll be asked to answer yes or no. Now, a lot of people are still don't knows. I'm not going to ask you to say what you think tonight. But inside, rate yourself on where you are in your decision. Most people are don't knows. But if you think that one is definitely a no, five is kind of middle of the road, nine's pretty well convinced of a yes, and ten is a definite yes. Have a think about where you are on that, on that um, score. We are looking for something that will allow us to build a better society, to give vent and allow our hopes to be realised. And the reason it's people in Scotland that are getting the vote on this is that we think that the people that live here, that know the problems, the good things and the untapped potential are the best people to make the decisions about how things can be changed for the better. We're going to have a look at several of the questions that often come up in the media that you probably hear. Could we survive as an independent Scotland? Can we afford independence? What would be the effect on Orkney? And just a wee recap, maybe two, on what has been achieved already with the Scottish Parliament. So, Scotland. Is Scotland too small to be an independent country? Don't listen to me. Listen to Alistair Darling and David Cameron. They're voting no, or pers uh, and persuading others to vote no. But in their words, lots of key politicians are now coming over to the collective view that yes, indeed, Scotland has the ability to be an independent country. There's a uh, former Chancellor Lawson, Nigella Lawson's father, um, a thinking member of the Conservative Party, honest, Scotland is perfectly capable of being an independent nation. There are many independent countries in the world who have got a lot less going for them. And sometimes we navel gaze so much at our own little patch that we don't realise, you know, the other countries that are like that. There on the left, populations with a similar uh, number to Scotland, ours is 5 million. On the right there, populations of countries a little smaller. All of these countries are independent nations. Also, countries that are smaller than Orkney, some that, well, I certainly haven't heard of, but also smaller than Orkney and Shetland combined, very small populations, Liechtenstein, Monaco, St Kitts and Nevis. These ones are probably more familiar. New Zealand's one that's often um, held up, a very Scottish tradition in New Zealand with the church that went out there and took a lot of Scottish <coughs> customs, legal systems and, and, and uh, other things to, to there. More recently, Ireland, U Uruguay, Jamaica, Iceland, about the size of Aberdeen in population, but a self-standing independent country. Lots of voters are unsure about the economy, the money. Can Scotland afford to be independent? And it's interesting actually to learn that Scotland generates a greater amount in tax, which it sends down to Westminster, than it gets back out again to spend back in Scotland. These are the figures, 9.9% of all UK taxes are generated in Scotland but only 9.3 come, comes back. When you translate that into actual money, it's a staggering 4.4 billion pounds of money that even if nothing else changed, if Scotland couldn't raise money from other places, that money would be available to spend on whatever choices people in Scotland thought the money should be spent on. Oil. <coughs> there is oil in the North Sea, and that, this has been 
uh, affirmed by others, experts, people who don't have a particular political axe to grind, but have a, an industry interest. 24 billion barrels of oil in the North Sea. It is harder to get at. They have taken the easy stuff out first, but technology and ability, expertise, which we have a huge amount of in Scotland, is developing to be able to extract that difficult oil. What's interesting is that because of the huge amount of MOD sea space around about Scotland, huge areas on the west side of Scotland, which are used for uh, naval exercises, can't be investigated for oil or any other resources for that matter. And only after all these things are discussed and talked about in the secret cabinet meetings do we actually learn much later what has been going on. So 30 years on, after the 30-year rule has elapsed when these secret papers can become, become made public, we learned that lots of this was suppressed so that you and I, ordinary people, didn't know what the potential was. There were people that knew, but they kept it well hidden for, for their own reasons. Even without oil, Scotland has a good mix of industries, and key is that you want a mix. You don't want any... Um, a country or economy overly dependent on one thing or two things. So we've got tourism, food and drink, creative industries which are increasing all the time, construction, rural and island economies. We've got the potential, unrealised as yet, for wind, tidal and wave power. A whole lot of things going for us. The GDP, GDP of Scotland per head is £28,500. That compares to the UK average of 24350 So even without Scotland's oil, without the oil in the equation, the GDP per head of population is 99% of the UK average. So Scotland stands pretty well. Now that... Um, uh, hallowed uh, building there, costs £50 million pounds per annum to run. If we had our own setup in Scotland, our own political setup, that didn't have a House of Lords, we wouldn't be sending people down to Westminster, we wouldn't be sending, um, paying the wages, paying the, um, the costs of all of those MPs at Westminster, and certainly not the Lords either. That would be a saving. Trident, which is something that we have had imposed on us in Scotland, is a massive expense. £250 million pounds per year. I mean, I think I find it quite difficult to, you know, put into real terms of those sorts of figures when people start talking about billions of this and millions of that. It's a very significant annual cost. This is not a one-off cost, annual cost. And look at the kinds of things we could choose if that was the desire of the people to use that sort of money on. Teachers, nurses, primary schools. You might have different priorities. Those are just examples. So people living in Scotland generate £10,700 per head in taxes taxes that you pay through VAT, through income tax, all the other things, which is higher than the UK average. And our public spending is a lower percentage of our economy than the UK's. The deficit is also 5% of the G G GDP of the UK, lower than UK average. Now, key in this whole run-up, as things have... Uh, come out during the referendum period and people are starting to get real about it. The UK debt is clocking on every second as I speak. Um, it is the UK's debt but the UK has agreed that it will guarantee the debt 
even if there's a, Scot a, a, vote, a Scottish independence vote for yes. And that's significant because the UK is starting to seriously quantify and measure out what it needs to do to protect not only itself, but Scotland in the event of a yes vote. Now, Alistair Darling, former Chancellor to the Exchequer, has said that we can perfectly well use the pound and it would be logical and desirable. The current position of the SNP and the Yes campaign agrees. Because it saves on the massive amounts of transaction costs, if you change money or you, send, or you pay for something in a different country, you have to pay a percentage in, 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 in transaction costs. And it mounts up to a massive amount if it's big businesses moving money around back and forth all the time. But also, it's very important because the two economies of Scotland and the rest of the UK would remain very similar, that that kind of stability remains. So that's Alistair Darling saying that, yes, using the pound in a currency union is a good idea. And getting back again to the economy and whether we can afford it, we would be ranked the eighth wealthiest country in the OECD. And that's compared with the UK's current position of 16th. Again, here's Nigel Lawson. So, we've established that, yes, Scotland could be an independent country. It's got the economic ability. Um, so, the remaining question is should. And that is where we would like to think about the reasons why, yes, it should. And it's democratic. Westminster, the large Victorian Gothic type, I don't know if that's the correct architectural term, but I'll use it, that huge institute in, in London, institution, out of the 68 years since the end of the war, 1945, 34 of these years, Scotland's been run by government which didn't have a majority in Scotland. Now, it's meant that people in Scotland have exercised their the, the democratic right, voted for policies and parties which they firmly believed in, but then got something else. So they've been frustrated in the desires and the pr priorities they wanted for Scotland. <coughs> for instance, more recently, the sale off of the Royal Mail Scottish Parliament consensus is that it should remain in public ownership. And that's not the SNP, it's the consensus of all the parties in Scottish Parliament. Because although there is a particular party in dominance in the Scottish Parliament, there are other parties there as well. And it's worth noting too that the, the method of electing people to the Scottish Parliament is much more representative of the actual views of the people in the country than is the current first-past-the-post Westminster system. <coughs> the Scottish Parliament, again the consensus of the different parties in the Parliament, doesn't agree with the tax and welfare reforms that the Liberal and Conservative co coalition are bringing in. And of course, nobody actually voted for a Lib Dem coalition either. Not even the Conservatives, nor the Liberals who are part of it. So at the moment, we have the most ludicrous non-democratic situation in the UK that you could imagine. <coughs> the NHS, to, uh, to an extent, is protected in Scotland because it's part of the devolved powers of the Scottish Parliament. But because of what's happening in England, it will begin to undermine the protection that we have up here. Because the English, the, the English NHS is insisting, the English, the, the, the bill in, that's gone through the UK Parliament is insisting that 40% of beds now go out to private uh, patients. And the more that private money comes into hospitals, 
the more pressure there is on the, the non-private beds. Now, we have a Tory MP in, in Scotland, elected through proportional representation, which is only fair that people who have all kinds of different uh, philosophies should have their representation. But out of all the others, it's a very small um, representation. And the majority of Scottish MPs voted recently in these sorts of percentages against welfare cuts, against the bedroom tax. 60% didn't want Trident. 82% were against the Royal Mail sell-off. We were totally impotent to stop any of these things and yet look at the, the kind of feeling there was against all of these. The way the Scottish Parliament works is that it is allocated a budget from Westminster. Um, it's a bit like getting, you know, your pocket money or, or your allowance, but that, maybe I'm being a bit uh, cheeky in saying that. But it's a fixed, fixed amount of money, and the Scottish Parliament can't borrow, it can't do anything other than work within that budget, and it does work within that budget. It's managed to introduce many, many things which have been beneficial, like these free prescriptions, and yet still manage to work within that budget. At the moment, it can make decisions on 7% of the bud budget which we raise within Scotland as a whole. And we're allowed to make decisions about the NHS, justice, education, environment, transport and housing. But if you think of some of the massive problems that there exist, even among these devolved uh, these devolved things, there's massive investment needed on top of what's already going in, in housing, for instance, transport, education. The Scotland Act, which the no parties would like you to think will be an advantage, will allow 15% of say over what is spent in Scotland. That's hardly going to address some of the issues that I think that are outstanding. So, Scottish Parliament has voted for no student fees, free personal care, no prescription charges, the council tax has been frozen, land reform, they have an anti-nuclear policy, and they've done all that balancing the budgets without going into deficit. Now, if we get independence, it's so simple. We get 100% power over the money that we raise in Scotland. And that is the, the economy. People often say, well, it's economy I'm worried about. When you think, what is the economy? Well, <clears throat> the economy is, I guess, the money that there is, but also when you can use money as a tool to make things happen. We get so hung up on thinking of money as a thing that happens in banks or the stock exchange or something. Money is a tool. And if the tool is locked up in banks and can't be used, there's not much point in it. It's like having um, all your gold doubloons in a sock under your bed or something that is completely useless. So money is a tool. And the, the tool that we need is to be able to use it to make good decisions about welfare and pensions so that our vulnerable people, our elderly people, can be relaxed about not having to worry if they can't work, if they're ill, if something befalls them they weren't expecting, and that they don't have to think about being homeless or poor when they're old. Defence. We would make decisions about whether we were an, ag an aggressive nation, a policing nation, a peacekeeping nation, a neutral nation. Lots of types of defence are not necessarily to do with going into other countries and trying to tell them how they should be running things. Oil and gas reserves, again, we use money as a tool to enhance research, development, 
make things cleaner, make things fairer, foreign affairs, a lot to do in that in terms of education. Um, again, with more of a, a, a peaceful slant perhaps than there has been in the past. And broadcasting. Interesting to think that we're having this meeting in here tonight um, and you're probably hearing things that you might not have heard on the radio or the TV. The fact is, every single newspaper that's sold in Scotland is owned outside Scotland, mainly by very, very wealthy individuals or businesses who are interested in making money, not necessarily interested in what the well-being of the population of this country is. Uh, <coughs> the TV media is also owned by very large, wealthy businessmen or women who have specific interests. And I mean, if you followed like the Murdoch situation, you can see exactly where the sorts of priorities and ethos of lots of these companies lie. So we would have control over Scottish broadcasting, which would enable us to examine the things that we're doing right, wrong, be held to account also, because you need good investigative journalists that do a good job and take people to task. But not, that, not, that's, not a broadcaster that simply slags people off or twists the truth to uh, suit a particular agenda. Um, we also could be using broadcasting in term to encourage lots more creative industries in Scotland. So, how would it affect Orkney? <coughs> Orkney, again, it's almost it's like a microcosm of the Scottish economy. Food and drink, engineering and science, oil and gas, we've got lots of knowledge of that here. The new renewables industries and the new research that that's bringing in, lots, the number of young people that are in Stromness and Roundabout now who are creating a buzz and a, 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 um, enthusiasm about new things. We've got our own creative industries as well, and of course, tour tourism. So Orkney has got a good, strong, mixed economy too. And our local council, along with Shetland and the Western Isles, are capitalising on the, uh, I guess, the attention that they, they can get at the moment. Um, because interestingly, other islands in other member states of Europe have a much better deal when it comes to European funding in terms of especially islands that are peripheral or a bit uh, fragile, distant from the centres of markets and they can get status enshrined you know, in statute that gives them equality in the market for instance so that they're not paying double freight to import things to, to then uh, manufacture within Orkney, then export again, two, two lots of freight expense. Fixed links, that's another one. Lots of the Nordic countries have uh, tunnels and bridges across islands. And lots of that has come about because when their countries negotiated EU entry, they were able at that point, right on the ground floor of entry at the EU treaty, to say, right, our islands need these types of special uh, provisions, and they did that then. The UK could have done that when they entered the common market in the 70s, but they didn't. I'm afraid islands and, you know, slightly less, say, uh, glitzy communities were not uppermost in their minds at, at that point in time. So, we do have to be concerned about our traditional industries. One of the really scandalous things that's happened most recently is that the, the reform of the agricultural policy and of the fisheries policy in, in Europe has meant that money is ring-fenced to go to places that have a more difficult time growing things. Scotland, the Highlands, Orkney have a short summer. They have... Uh, less light, less quality of light to grow grain, hilly hillsides, uh, 
you know, heather, barren moors, that kind of thing. The quality of the land's not so good as it is in the, the, the rolling shires of, of, of England. So money is targeted to help farmers up in, in these areas. And the money that has been earmarked for use in Scotland has been held back by the UK government. So our farmers are not getting the money that they should be getting the system. And this is translating into a very significant amount of money. <coughs> so they're only getting 16.4% of the funds that the EU has given to Westminster because of uh, their particular needs. When we look at fishing, um, fishing was a huge sacrifice that the UK government made in the 70s to gain entry to the common market. Um, and the fishing industry nationally in Scotland has uh, de you know, diminished out of all recognition to what it once was. In Orkney, we are highly reliant on our lobster and crab industry and also our uh, scallop industry. But our inshore grounds, which are out to six nautical miles around the islands, are totally unprotected. Any boat from anywhere that can claim a historic right to fish can come into the waters without being stopped. And in the last year, we have seen huge pressure, especially on the east side of Orkney, from big industrial scallop dredgers. So Orkney needs to take steps to protect their fishery as well. Now, we've got a general election coming up in 2016, and now both the major parties, Labour and Conservative, have said that they will back a referendum on the UK's continuing position in the EU. Now, <coughs> in this referendum period, everybody is asking for certainties. The truth is, nobody can give anyone cast iron certainties. No one predicted the banking crash. No one predicted foot and mouth, when we got that. No one predicted, you know, the devastation of the flooding in the southeast of England. So things happen that you have to deal with. We don't know whether the UK will be in Europe in 2017, if Scotland will still be in the UK and will still be in Europe, or will be out of Europe. That's an uncertainty. You need to look carefully at what the other side are offering you. When they demand cross T's, dotted I's, detail from the Yes campaign, you need to ask them what kind of detail and guarantees they're going to supply. The other parties, which have united, of course, um, over the, the refusal to uh, uh, facilitate a currency union, are at this point unable to come to an agreement on any collective policy that they can offer you for what will happen if you vote no. The Barnet formula is the means by which the allocation of money to Scotland is, is worked out. And what we have uh, heard George Osborne say is that there's £60 million of austerity cuts still to come. It's very unlikely that the Barnet formula will remain in its current shape. So that £35 billion worth of allowance that Scotland has is very unlikely to stay at that level. I can't give you a certainty, but I can give you a balance of probabilities. If you remember the re referendum in 1979, you'll recall that we were told that if we voted no, we would get 
something better. The referendum took place and it took 20 years to get the current Scottish Parliament. Basically, once the referendum was off the table, everybody said, oh, we can just forget about that. It completely went off the radar. <clears throat> the Labour Party appeared to be um, in a bit of a crisis, I think, about how they deal with this. Uh, because they are so anti the idea of self-determination um, that they seem to be completely blinded. And I say that as someone who comes from a, a Labour, Labour voting family. What the opposers of independence are trying to make everyone feel is frightened about things that they, might happen. Um, that we have more to lose. These intangible, frightening, scary things that shadows that are playing on the wall are somehow going to be so disastrous. But remember, fear is a thing that takes place in the imagination. And when you actually have to confront a fear with a spider, or if it's, like for me, it's birds actually, when you actually have to do that, like, you know, take a starling out of the chimney, you just think, right, there's nobody else to do this, I'm going to have to do it, and you find a way to do it. Fear is such a damaging and um, a unfair thing to, to put into people, really, because... Once you start to tackle that fear, you learn an awful lot about yourself and about what you can do and about what you can overcome and achieve. So, we all have friends, relatives, all over the world probably, as well as in other parts of the United Kingdom. And the last thing that this referendum is about is about making anybody a foreigner anywhere. There's always going to be a customs union. Nobody will be made unwelcome or be a foreigner in their own country. Um, that's what the border is probably going to look like. That's the border between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. The key thing is, an independent Scotland is going to start life in a pretty good state. We're a developed country, we've got infrastructure, we've got um, lots of eager, willing, um, talented people ready to take on the creation and the betterment of the country. That's what the Financial Times says, and the Financial Times uh, is not a paper that will get excitable about things. Former Secretary of State for Scotland, Michael Moore, Again, I think a thinking man, you know, who takes time to think through things, has said that he doesn't think there'll be any objections to uh, Scotland becoming a member of the EU. And in fact, no member state has even hinted that it would veto or reject Scottish membership. The reality of the current Scottish Parliament is that it's a... It's an allowance from the Westminster UK government. It's there by grace of Westminster. It quite literally, by the stroke of a pen, could go. Powers that it currently have, has could go. And remember, the number of MPs that we've got in Scotland are so tiny that if there was a will to do that in Westminster, it would be unstoppable. And it's currently taking powers from the Westminster, the Welsh Assembly. Now, <clears throat> the no campaign are adamant that David Cameron shouldn't debate with the First Minister of the Scottish Parliament. It makes you wonder why it's okay that he is the ultimate. Uh, 
uh, person in charge of the UK at the moment, governing Scotland. And in the press, and perhaps in your own selves, you'll be thinking, yeah, it's all very fine, but it's just a license to have the SNP forever, and that horrible Alex Salmond. Um, because in some, in some sections of the media, and certainly among a lot of, lot of the public, um, the, they have created a, a monster persona for Alex Salmon. But this is the, the, this is the only thing I think I would want you to really take away with you tonight if you, don't, if you don't take on board anything else. That you're not being asked to vote for a person. You're not being asked to vote for a politician. You're not being asked to vote for a party. You're simply being asked to say, should Scotland be an independent country? The decisions on the parties and the politicians will take place later. That's another step. <clears throat> we would genuinely like to know what people's uh, uncertainties are, what they feel uncomfortable about, what they fear, because of course there are, are risks and fears with, with any type of change. Um, We've got some leaflets there on the table if you want to fill them in and hand them back at the end of the night. But you can also contact us in a more you know, anonymous way if you want by emailing. Uh, you can email Yes Scotland there, but we also have our own email which we can provide you with. Um, or you can talk to any, of, any one of us at any time. But this is an exciting time. It's a completely unique time. It's a time when it's right to be as well informed as you can be and to push for answers and we are delighted to try and help provide honest, sound answers for you. So that's our contact details there. You can get us on Facebook as well and, and we're on Twitter and uh, we're also can be collared and tripped up and harangued at any time. I think that's us about finished, are we? Yeah. So um, maybe five minutes just for anybody that wants to ask anything just now. But I mean, if you don't like to speak up enough, you don't have to. It's uh, completely up to yourselves. Just whatever you feel happy to do. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Um, probably like everybody here, I've got relations and really close ties. But when you do visit our societies are different in the way they're developing. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe highlight about how you think after a hope for independent Scotland, society would maybe develop? Because I'm thinking in particular about the report yesterday that nearly a million people in Scotland are living below mm -hmm. the breadline. Mm -hmm. People are really struggling, mm -hmm. even in Orkney. Now a food bank. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe expand on that a little bit? Yeah, one of the things, well I mean I have a, I have a sister in Scarborough and uh, she's very uneasy about this and I think it's the abandonment of people in England that, that uh, you know, working people that are, are facing just exactly the same types of problems and issues with uh, a very central London government that's that's happy to build a financial sector, but not really caring too much about providing public services. Um, this cannot be about abandoning anyone. I think the reality for me certainly is that I want to see um, something change and happen that gives hope to people elsewhere. And I think that we have got the catalyst for change in Scotland, for social change, for empowerment of people, and also an example, this type of you know, um, coming together of, of people to think and talk together um, and think of, new, think of good ideas and ways to make things better is, is pretty unusual you know, in the last 50 or so years. Um, and I think it's a beacon of 
example and hope to other people that are toiling under just the same kind of disenfranchisement. Because certainly I know that, you know, there are people in London that are desperately poor as well. And it's not about abandoning anybody. But I think trying to affect change with the kind of grip that has now uh, got hold of the Westminster established system, that the, ch the change is just not possible. I cannot see how it can be done. Um, does that answer your question? Well, yes, and also I wanted maybe more about how Scotland would make it mm. if it was independent. Well, I, I think this. More further. Yeah, I mean, I think this this is a choice for all of you. If we do attain independence and we have our first general election in Scotland, because obviously you will make a decision at the ballot box uh, to vote for the party that has the priorities and choices that you think are most worthy. Now, you could have all sorts of different views in this room, and that's what's brilliant about the Yes campaign, because we have everybody from, you know, Greens and Conservatives, Liberals, everybody, all with slightly different views on how, how things should go. The likelihood is, but there's no, there's no guarantee, is that I would think, and this is just my guess, others might have a different view, is that there'll be a kind of more of a green agenda, more of a labour agenda than there perhaps has been. Um, but we have to make that happen, I think. You know, and it's up to people. It doesn't stop with getting yes. That's only when the work begins, actually. I think, if I just come in for a second, I think two significant things that you would find if you spoke to civil servants in Scotland. <coughs> with, a, with proportional representation, they're now dealing with people like we've got an independent MP, Margot MacDonald. We did in the first parliament have a, an MP for the elderly community, what have you. And we've got Greens and what have you are actively uh, influencing policy and direction. And the civil servants in the Scottish parliament are saying, first of all, that is very unusual. Uh, they, they, they've not experienced, they hadn't experienced that previously when we had a first post, past the post system. But the second thing was, what they're finding too, is that ministers are having to come in to them and say, look, this is what I would like to achieve. This is what I feel would be good for whatever subject it was, education, health, justice, etc. How do we go about getting the best solution here? And the civil service is saying that they have never, prior to the Scottish Parliament being in existence, been asked their opinion. They were always told, this is the policy that's coming in, and this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. And they actually didn't find that there was that empowerment. So they, I think what you're, you're finding with the Scottish Parliament is that there's a greater degree of uh, that empowerment uh, happening to people. Because other MSPs are much, much closer to the people than an MPs. Uh, well. Also, we've got a, a bigger agenda for social justice. You see where the policies that are already, that you know, about when some of the things there, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of policies, the free prescriptions, the care for the elderly, all of these things. Um, since the evolution, our ideas about politics have diverged to the extent that we're looking at social justice. We're looking to minimise that gap between the rich and the poor that they have in Nordic countries. I mean, that's been raised as an issue before. So that everybody benefits from the state. So I think that with an independence that we can see a wide divergence. Okay, there might be mistakes made and there might be things that have to go back to the drawing board, but, but essentially it's about making life better. For example, um, pensions. In Scotland, we have, unfortunately, a lower life expectancy than other parts of the UK. Staying with Westminster as they extend that the age for retirement will very much, um, you know, impinge on the, um, on the elderly Scottish folk and things like that. So under a new um, independent Scotland, they could look again at that. They, could look at, they will be t able to take into account the needs of the people in Scotland. And when they uh, revise the welfare state and so on, what if any of this at all rubbish and people starving in food banks? This is a, a wealthy country with plenty of food. There is no need for people, and I could not believe the other day reading that people have taken food back to the food banks because they don't have the means to cook it. They don't have the means to heat the food. 
this day age. So that's, I mean, independence is about a lot of things, but for me it's really about social justice and it's about making things better for everybody. And it can be done in Europe, it can be done, it can be done in Finland, in Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and other countries around the world. And you would see, and I think you would see a very different kind of case. Scotland is actually economically strong enough mm -hmm. because the um, the no campaign is so powerful, mm -hmm. and in England everyone just says it was fungus. Yeah, they do. Yes, that's you know, that's a whole climate mm -hmm. that, that yeah. Scotland's just taking, taking, taking. We're greedy. So that was great to know. Um, but I've just got a couple of observations. I don't think you should ever quote Nigel Lawson for anything because he's, he's a mad client and you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, he's, he's a nutter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the other one is, I didn't recognise what you said about Alistair Darling because I, I didn't know he said yes, we would have the pound. He's he said it would be perfectly logical and sensible. He's now turned round, of course, with the, although he wasn't in the, in the vanguard of the, the three uh, Westminster parties that said that they were going to refuse it, but uh, um, you can, it's, it you is can. perfectly sensible. <laughs> You'd think that someone who'd run the economy would, would know it's perfectly sensible, but when you put that slide up, I'm going, but you, wait. <laughs> but if you need to verify that, he stated that in front of Gordon Brewer on Newsnight in January 2015. So if you use the eye clear, you should get back to that program. I, I'm not saying you got it wrong, I'm no, just no, saying no. I was gone. No, no, but, it, but that's what he said. It was logical and desirable. That's what he said to Gordon Brewer. Now, Gordon Brewer on Newsnight is nobody's mug. If he thinks he's coming to harm, he would really have a go at him. He just accept it. But what, what you say kind of illustrates the huge amount of power the media has yeah. got in propaganda yeah. against, you know, what the real situation is. And, um, yeah, the, the pounds one, but we, le we learned recently that the whole um, uh, assault on not letting Scotland use the pound had, was planned six months ago in order to coincide with the financial reporting season so that when they said that, it meant all the big financial uh, com houses and companies had to come out with a statement um, and react it. It was, it was engineered for maximum damage you know, to, the, to the referendum campaign, so it's, it's been carefully structured. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, of course, the things that would back up what we see, like, for example, Standard & Poor, your uh, uh, credit rating agency that gives ratings to countries, said that an independent Scotland would have a triple A rating without, even without the oil. Mm -hmm. And we haven't really seen that, but that should be the lead story mm -hmm. in papers. I thought, I thought some of those only fact slides were really, really useful, because I didn't know half that. Mm -hmm. And how would I know? Because we have a and the other argument is that uh, the currency union is in England's best interest because Scotland, uh, England is Scotland's biggest market. But what they forget to point out is that Scotland is England's second biggest um, export market after the USA. So it's in everybody's interest to do this. The other argument that always comes up is, oh, well, what's plan B? Well, there's plan B, plan C and plan D in the white paper, Scotland's future and what we can do. Um, I, I heard Alistair come out the other day categorically, in fact, he said it in opinion in his column, that we cannot use the pound. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can use the pound. We don't have to have a currency union to use it. We can use the pound. We can use whatever we like. We can use smarties. Mm -hmm. But we can use the pound. We can do that. And we can, use, we can have our own currency. It is, it is not an issue. There was a, a very, very good press release today from two experts, one of whom is a Nobel Prize winning economist, saying exactly why Westminster would go for a currency union after a yes vote. Because it's entirely in interest to do so. Bear in mind that this, this whole operation is called Operation Dam Busters by Project Fear. And remember what the original name of that operation was it was Chastise. But Dam Busters is just a popular name for that. This is a plan way of making us as frightened as possible so that we, we, we feel that we just can't take that final loop. So. The, the, the two interesting. All this kind of thing is about the fear and all that. But to me, even let's say there was a vote for, for yes, let's say we won. And I, you know, I'd be English, although I'd love to be Scottish, and I hope one day it would accept me to be Scottish. 
Well, put it like this, I owe English, but I came up here and I love the system up here. But to me, if, if there's independence, if this is so, and I'd rather not call it independence, I'd rather call it uh, the, the, the dissolution of the, of the union, you know, because we were supposed to be equal partners in a union, just like in marriage, which I don't see that, that being the case, I don't think it ever was, but uh, we've been used. But um, the point is that after an independence, there would be a hell of a lot of legal arguments. They would probably go on for years to come. The, the, you know, this bit over the, the use of the pound, you know, whatever, whatever way it is, um, we, we have to apply, the English government would probably have to apply the hang on to it, they would have to go into courts, it would be argued because there's probably no precedent on it, it would have to be argued for, for me. So individuals like these politicians at the moment, standing up and saying what they're saying, they have no right to say it, they can't. They don't yeah, have that in the basis. Basis. And the Chancellor is, is not actually legally entitled yeah. to say whether they can have a currency union or not. And it's exactly the same in the EU. You know, they can't say, well, you, we wouldn't allow you in the EU, or other countries can't say, we wouldn't allow you. As you say, you have been in as part of the United Kingdom standard for so long. I, I, I would very much doubt if they wouldn't accept us and they accept us very quickly. It's in their interest. You know, they like small minorities. So. I, I, you know, if this was a divorce, you know, you, you would have, to, you would engage solicitors. I mean, I'd like to think that we would have, I don't know, not maybe the United Nations, but a group here that, that would be overseeing our divorce. And, you know, there would be an equal division. We ought to know that that kind of thing would happen and, and, and it would be fair and equal. And, uh, you know, what these people say at the moment is just a, a load, of, uh, load of rubbish. The other thing that I'd like to know is, like myself and Carrie here, but other people, you know, how many English people, after five years of independence, when they say this is a fairer, juster, equal nation, uh, nation, would want to move here from England? Because I know for a fact my family come from northern England. And they say, how lucky you are in Scotland to have a vote on independence. We wish we got that in Northern England. Because it isn't just, you know, us in Scotland who would like independence. There's a lot of people who would like to cut off that bottom southeast corner of Britain and shove it out into the bloody middle of the Atlantic somewhere. <laughs> because that's how much they feel attached to them. Because they've been deserted, a lot of people have been de deserted by the Atlantic. Uh, I know for a fact that there's a community up here, you know, as a country up here, you're more community based. You're not individually, you're not greedy. You want what's best for, the, for you, you as a group. And that's what's really appealing. It's a lovely country to be in. And I think you've got so much going for it. And I'm proud to be here now. It's a great place to be. But it's and not I'm a really question of you, it's us. Yeah. It's yeah. the people of Scotland, not the Scottish people, right. that will make this decision. That's you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh to, yes, I would have you know, For example, passports, you've been entitled to, if you're living in Scotland on the day of the referendum, or actually probably more like Independence Day, you will be entitled to a Scottish passport, for example. And I, I would be the first one queuing up for my country. And you've been entitled to have a British one as well, because that's the question I get. I got asked that on Monday by a group of students. But, uh, yeah. So it's not, it's not you, it's us. But I'd, I'd like to know just so many other English would love to come and live up here. If it was, you know, well, the future. <laughs> what was quite funny and interesting, um, uh, when David Cameron made his speech from the Olympic velodrome, um, telling people in England to phone their friends and relatives in Scotland and tell them, you know, that they didn't want Scotland to leave. Um, what was what was in, ha in fact happening was on Twitter and Facebook and all these things was people saying. Yes, Scotland, go on, go and vote for independence, and then we can move up as well. And, and, and it was hilarious because there was just a massive avalanche of message of, of that kind, you know. I mean, maybe tongue in cheek, but maybe not, you know. So, um, but I mean, the, the, the issue of uh, the population is obviously Scotland needs a population, and it's struggled to maintain its population, and it's starting to grow a wee bit now, but. One of the things Scotland needs is, is people, and people are your assets, so it makes sense that people move into Scotland from wherever, you know? Yeah. And we have fantastic, eclectic mix of nationalities 
in the country, which I think is is really strong and vibrant, and um, it's a great example how well actually people live together in Scotland. I think. Just to get a little bit academic for a minute, Scotland is the only country in Europe that has never passed any laws against the Jews, for example. <laughs> That's just a, 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 a useless fact, but it's, I think it says a lot about the kind of place that this is throughout history. It's not new, but like this, as you see, the eclectic mixture of it is a fact. Anybody else? John? Yeah, um, to the neutral observer over the past seven years, um, the Scottish government, SNP government, uh, has been moderate, middle of the road, outward looking, civic nationalism. Um, it's done quite well with limited powers that are available to it. So what we're suggesting to you is that we all the powers we could do that much more. Um, for example, I spent my working life uh, 40 years in education. Um, we're well educated. Scotland has got five universities in the top 200 in the world, but it's only a small country of five million people. Um, we've got a tradition of engineering and making things and doing things, going to other parts of the world and um, doing civil engineering, building things, setting up administrations and so on. And then just to come uh, uh, to Stromness itself, now Stromness it's a uh, fishing town, it's a holiday town, it's a heritage town, it's a ferry port, it's also a university town today. Um, there's a lot of good jobs up in, in, in ICIT, Harriet Watt University, and then there's EMEC, which is exciting engineering things that are taking place. So there's actually quite a lot going for Orkney at large, um, but also for Stromness itself on the smaller scale. And uh, we also saw, was it last week, that that, in that survey that um, Ark is one of the best islands destinations in the world to have holidays as well. So I think the, the message there is that uh, if we get independence, we're not intending to make a mess of it, we're intending to make a go of it. And she's pointing out too that no country that's achieved independence has ever asked to go back. <laughs>